All right, so this is live. I'll give it a few minutes. All right, if you're ready, we're going to get started here. Hi, everyone. I am Nicole Forbes. I am the Content and Activation Manager for Equitana USA. We were very much hoping we'd be at the Kentucky Horse Park next weekend um, to celebrate Equitana live and in person. But in lieu of that, we have several of our presenters who are sharing their knowledge with us and going to get us excited for next year when we can see them live. Uh, today we have an equine nutritionist and Dr. Narita Richards has so many acronyms behind her name. <laughs> You'll have to explain them yourself. <laughs> but um, she's an expert in the field and we're thrilled to have her with us today. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Narita Richards. Thanks so much, Nicole. And um, yes, gosh, Kentucky is one of my favorite places in the whole world. And in fact, the very first time I came to the US, uh, that was where I landed in, um, in Kentucky. And it was in the middle of the night. I was only really young and um, it was like a whole other world to me. And I just loved it. It was, it was so beautiful there. So yeah, a little, a little disappointment that we're not there, but um, I know we will get to do it sometime and um, it's really great to be able to do um, these sorts of things via zoom because you know we can still bring knowledge to people which is great um, so as my accent probably gives away very quickly i'm actually based in australia um, so it's about a it's about a 35 hour journey to kentucky from where i <laughs> I live so it's um it's a pretty big trip so it was a lot easier just walking into my home based office this morning to do this to do this presentation but uh, I have got an undergrad in rural science which is an agricultural degree and then I did my PhD specifically in equine nutrition which was back I started in 2000 so it's 20 years ago um, and ever since I finished that in 2003 I have been uh, working as a consulting nutritionist so uh, I have lots of clients in Australia obviously but also work with companies in the US and um, more recently in Japan which has been a lot of fun um, seeing how the horse industry operates up there uh, and along that way realized that I've really had no easy way of assessing horses diets and so we built what is now known as the feed XL uh, nutrition calculator which is a calculator to work out if what we are feeding a particular horse is actually meeting that horse's nutrient requirements. So it's now available all around the world. It's used extensively in the US, um, here in Australia, it's also in New Zealand, Canada and the UK. Um, so it's, it's something we'll talk about that a little bit along the way, just because it's a really handy tool to be able to help when feeding a horse um, for better behavior. So, what I want to talk about today and something that we um, we often survey our FedExL members and say, what are, what are some of the biggest issues that you struggle with? And horse behavior is one of them that they, that is constantly ranks at the top of the list. And of course, you know, you hop on a horse and, and it's a whole lot of power underneath you. And if that power is not working with you, um, it does get pretty dangerous and pretty scary quite quickly. And, and I know um, I've had quite a number of horses that have not been, a pleasure to ride um, so it, it's a it's it's one that I guess as riders is at the front of our minds a lot and nutrition has got such a massive role to play when it comes to moderating that behavior so um, the talk today is my horse is crazy uh, my horse is lazy so behavior can be frustrating on both ends of the spectrum either you've got you've got too much energy and 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 too much horse underneath you 
or you get on a horse that is such hard work to ride and by the time you get off your legs are tighter than your horse's legs from just trying to keep that horse moving so um we'll cover we'll cover both ends of the spectrum as we go along and um hopefully it'll be there'll be a lot of things that people can just put into action really quickly and easily to to quite quickly see changes in their in their horse's behavior so i'll get started um and if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, type them into the chat box, into the Q&A section. We'll probably be addressing them both um, during the presentation and following the presentation. So don't worry if we miss it in the uh, meantime, we'll get to it at the very end. Yeah, yeah, cool. So what we'll cover today uh, are some of the things that changes, causes change in behavior. Um, so there's quite a number of things that will actually cause changes in behavior in your horse. We'll have a look at the eight top tips for feeding for beautiful behavior. We'll take a, a brief look at where the calming supplements work. We'll go through a hot horse action plan, a lazy horse action plan, and then at the end we'll have a look at five ways that, that FeedXL can actually help you put together diets that will support better behavior in your horse, depending whether you need more energy or less energy from your particular horse. So what causes changes in behavior? behavior. So there's eight things that I can come up with that cause change in behavior. I'm going to talk through each of those um, in a bit. So we'll just run through them really quickly here. So things like pain, education, of course, tying up uh, mycotoxins from either the pasture or the, the grain um, hard feeds that you're feeding. Compromised gut health is a big one. Hormones, um, your horse may not be fit enough and, and at the end there's nutrition so um, we'll, we'll spend a fair bit more time on nutrition than all of the other ones because that's, that's my thing. So the first one that we'll talk about is pain. So this is actually a radiograph of a, a little mare. Um, we actually lost her a couple of years ago. She was the most incredible little horse but she was always a little bit um, hesitant. So I could have just put it down to her being lazy, um, but it always felt like it was more hesitant than lazy. And when we had a look at her, um, her feet um, via radiograph, the vet, um, and I'm hopeless at looking at radiographs. I don't have a veterinary background, but um, there's long toes, thin soles, and she was just ouchy on her feet. Not enough to make her lame, but enough for her to shorten her stride and not really want to, um, to work the way that, that I would have liked her to. So once we got those little feet sorted out, um, or hooves sorted out, I should say, the, she, her movement completely changed um, and she was so willing and so forward. I was actually Actually astonished to see how much um, it it changed her but you know I guess it makes sense I think as as a female I have um, worn high heels to certain occasions and oh my goodness if they don't fit well by the end of the night you're in so much pain all you want to do is go and sit in the corner and be really antisocial so I guess um, we can understand when we've, we've experienced that that pain in our feet ourselves how much it does actually change our behavior so it's understandable that it would change your horse's behavior now there's a bunch of different pains um, it's obviously not only in the hooves you can also have um, pains from pain from gastric ulceration so that will definitely cause a, a horse to change its behavior and often you'll get that anxious you know bit chomping and um, just hyperactive behavior and, and and often what comes out is just being plain difficult or naughty um, and horses are, are often um, drilled and educated more to stop them from behaving the way they're behaving and all the horse is trying to tell you is it is actually in pain because they can't speak obviously they can't tell you what's wrong with them so they have to try and show you some way so um, if a horse is is um, misbehaving or behaving in a, in a way that you wouldn't normally expect them to behave then pain is always the first thing that I go to to go is there anything wrong with this horse that might be changing this behavior um, education is obviously huge um, and and on on both ends so um, I have my quarter horse poet is is typically what is an interesting one so he's a little bit he can be very hyperactive and unpredictable but it can also be very lazy um, and I realized I did a, a clinic with this amazing guy this is Justin Cahoon who's also an Aussie but um, travels all over the road doing all over the world doing clinics and um, has an incredible ability to communicate and to pick up what's going on with a particular horse and rider in in his clinics and um, he's watching me ride poet and he's like narrative your legs are on all the time um and so you know this horse had, had learnt to kind of ignore I guess my aids um and so you know taking the legs off and then giving him a, a very definite command when he when he changed um 
pace on me and I hadn't asked him to has made the world of difference for this horse. So, you know, I can put him now in a, in a certain gait at a certain speed and he will stay there until I ask him to change. And that was, that was all just, um, it was more rider education, mind you, not horse education, but, um, and then on the other end of the spectrum too, you know, Justin's got a whole bunch of techniques um, as every clinician and horse person, um, horseman would have of just slowing down those, those hyperactive horses and, and also, you know, making sure they've got manners and stuff. So, I mean, education is massive in this, but even the most well-educated horses, if they've got something else going on, so if they're in pain or if they've got any of, any of the other things that we're going to talk about going on, the, the education can only override so much of that. So you, you can't rely just on education to get really good behaviour out of a horse all the time because there's so many other things that impact their behaviour all the time. So the next one is tying up. So if you've had a horse that has experienced tying up, and I'm, I'm, um, there's, there's so many different types of tying up, um, the one that we probably focus on the most with behaviour is the one called polysaccharide storage myopathy. And even within that group, so it's abbreviated to PSSM, there's, there's a number of different types of PSSM a horse can get. But what you're looking at here on this slide is the um, muscle glycogen that accumulates in muscle fibres. So the green is the, is the glycogen um, Oh, the green or the blue, I've forgotten. It's been a while since I made this presentation, but um, the muscle glycogen in there. And with these PSSM horses, what happens is um, they actually accumulate too much of the, this glycogen in their muscles. So the glycogen is, is just the storage of glucose or the storage of energy within that horse's muscles. And for whatever reason, these horses with PSSM accumulate too much of that glycogen. And then the, the full reason is not known, but for whatever reason, that glycogen then causes um, a lot of muscle pain in these horses to the point where they will actually um, freeze. Um, so they, they won't move, they won't want to move at all. In really extreme cases, um, they like almost lock up and they can't move. But on a much subtler level, what we see is no change in movement really. You might feel a horse that, that feels a little bit stiff when you first start riding, but typically what we see is either what would be described as, as slow and lazy behaviour. So really common in, in warm blood dressage horses is dressage riders will describe to me like, oh, this horse is just so lazy, so hard to, to keep moving. Or on the other end of the spectrum, um, one horse that particularly sticks in my mind is this beautiful big warm blood, um, is grey, is stunning horse. Uh, and it was an inventor, um, but was horrendous when it came to behaviour, like would buck for half an hour straight um, with, a, with a rider on its back. And all that poor horse was trying to tell his rider was, my back's really sore, would you mind getting off? So that horse was actually tying up. And when we figured that out um, and put it on a, on a diet that, that stopped it from tying up, its behaviour completely changed. Uh, it was a different horse. So, you know, that that really hyperactive, dangerous behaviour was because the horse was in pain. And also, too, the slow and lazy, um, what we see in a lot of dressage horses, is also due to pain, much lower level pain. Um, but the horse is essentially just going, you know what, it really hurts to do these movements and so I don't want to do them um, and so and they do feel lazy and again when we get these horses onto diets that are, are suitable for these tying up horses and reduce that amount of glycogen that's going into their muscles their behavior changes you know they're much more forward and, and and much happier to do their work because they're not in pain anymore so again the behavior is is just trying to tell you that that something's not right Mycotoxins are um, not super well recognised, I guess, but they're, they're a huge player when it comes to horses changing their behaviour. <clears throat> I've got there, if your horse has a sudden and dramatic change in behaviour, mycotoxins shoot to the top of the list. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's not always a rule that the changes in behaviour from mycotoxins are dramatic, but they certainly can be. Um, so at the times of year when you've got either uh, your fescues or your ryegrasses are either um, grazed very short or quite long and have gone to seed like this ryegrass in the, in the photo there, that's when your mycotoxin loads are highest in these grasses. Um, and you'll see really dramatic changes sometimes. So, you know, I've had horses that owners 
couldn't even keep them in a yard. They kept jumping out over either the fe- over the fence or the or the gate. It was a show jumper, but still they couldn't they couldn't keep it anywhere. And it was so dangerous to handle this horse. Um, and he was on he was on ryegrass pasture, and so we said, well, let's see if it's the pasture. Let's take him completely off the off the pasture and see um, if he calms down. And within a week, he was back to his normal, very calm, very um, well mannered horse. And it was just that he had these mycotoxins in his system. Um, it has been described to me that one of the mycotoxins from ryegrass actually gets metabolized to something very similar to LSD. So if, if your horse is um, suddenly very spooky and seeing goblins everywhere, then um, it's possible that he actually is seeing goblins everywhere because he may be hallucinating. Um, so they, it's, it's something to keep in mind. If, if your horse is going along fine and then the, either the pasture changes or you bring in a new hay or something changes um, in that, with either fescue or ryegrass particularly, then it's always um, good to think that, you know, maybe it's a mycotoxin and you literally cannot get a horse to think properly if they're affected by mycotoxin. There is no amount of education or or hard work or um, changing feed. Anything that you do won't be able to override the effect of those mycotoxins on their system. So it's really important to um, keep that in your list of suspects uh, and do something about it if, if you think that it may be mycotoxin. Um, compromised gut health. So this this is something that we spend an awful lot of time talking about. So um, for us as humans, you know, the the advances in gut health at the moment are just amazing. So the, the technology that they've got to look at our microbiota in our gut, so our bacteria and our fungi and all the other things that, that live inside our gut um, has just made it possible to do, I guess, so much more amazing research. And in humans, you know, they're linking the the health of our gut microbiota to things like asthma and diabetes and mental health. So um, there's an estimate in humans, and I, I hear different estimates, so it probably depends where you, where you get the estimate from, but there's a, a hormone that, that we have in our body, horses have in their body called dopamine, and it's one of our happy hormones, so um, or a feel-good hormone. And um, we know that a, a large portion or a significant portion of that dopamine isn't produced by our body. <clears throat> so our body does produce dopamine and our horses' bodies would produce dopamine. Um, but, but you know, 50% is the estimate that I work on of dopamine is estimated to actually come from the, the bacteria in our gut, which is amazing because you think about, well, if you mess up the bacteria in your gut, instantly you've lost 50% of your happy hormone, which is not going to be a good thing for mental health. So <clears throat> with our horses and their behaviour, um, we know the the crew at um, Lab to Field in Dijon in France do the most amazing research in gut health. And, and one of the first things they talk about um, as an impact of, of compromising gut health is the change in behaviour and often the anxiety that you'll see with the change in behaviour. And I know from all of the, the horse people that I've worked with, over the years that um, you know if we can if we can take a horse and improve its gut health by changing um, the way that it's fed and also what it's fed often one of the things we'll see is this is this change in behavior and usually it's it's a change from being you know really wide up and anxious and chomping bits and you know, being really way too forward and um, and quite dangerous to ride, to, to calming right down because their, their gut health um, is supporting that behaviour. And also, too, when you've got compromised gut health, so if you, whether you've got gastric ulcers or you may have hindgut ulcers or hindgut acidosis, none of that is comfortable. I don't know if you've ever had a gastric ulcer, but it's really not comfortable um, to have a gastric ulcer. And so, again, it goes back to that pain um, as well, changing behaviour too. So there's a lot in gut health, like can't cover a whole lot of it here, but um, there's a you know if your horse if you've got having issues with a horse um, and behaviour gut health is definitely something to consider. Uh, hormones and I smile at this because I know full well um, personally how much hormones can change behaviour. So if you've got uh, a mare and um, she is behaving like that, uh, then it, it, it's just something to consider. And there's also, you know, I, I had my eyes open a couple of years ago at a conference with them. Um, A lady who was doing a presentation, and I can't remember the full details, but she was essentially talking about um, this mare's ovaries that had attached to some part of her abdominal 
wall or they'd attach to something that they shouldn't have attached and, and causing immense amounts of pain for a start. And, um, and also too, I think there was hormonal changes associated with that. And once they'd fixed that for this horse and um, her behavior changed completely. So um, if you've got a mare, do think about hormones and, and how she may be feeling with her hormones because they are powerful little chemicals um, and it, it could be something that's contributing to you. And it's, it's definitely a discussion to have with your um, veterinarian to see what you might be able to do if anything um, needs to be done to help her um, not be so affected. So not fit enough. So this is a big one if your horse feels a bit flat and lazy is if your horse isn't fit, he'll just feel plain old tired if you ask him to do more work than he has been prepared for. So you know, if you're riding a horse and he, after you know, 20 minutes into a lesson or 20 minutes into your ride, he's feeling really tired, then do think about whether he's actually fit enough to do the work that you're doing. So uh, if, you, if you run or do any, any type of sport, you'll know um, that if you're not fit enough to do the work you need to do, um, then very quickly you do feel very tired. So my um, the seven year old son has been really getting into soccer lately, and so there's a lot of one on one soccer matches in the in the backyard. And um, and he runs rings around me. He does over twenty thousand steps on his little Fitbit thing nearly a lot of days. So he's he's really fit, and I'm not nearly as fit as him. So um, you know after after. 10 or 15 minutes of chasing a soccer ball around with him. I'm, I'm feeling pretty tired and lazy too, but it's not, it's not for any other reason other than I'm just not fit enough to do the work that he's asking me to do. So keep that one in mind. And then the big one that we really want to talk about, of course, is nutrition. So there's a whole number of aspects of nutrition that will affect behaviour and there's a whole lot of things. The good thing is there's a whole lot of things that you can do and change really easily to um, moderate your horse's behaviour. So I'm going to go through now the eight best feeding tips um, for calm yet safe um, calm and safe yet responsive behaviour. So, you know, we don't want horses feeling really dopey and lazy because it's not enjoyable to ride. So you, you want them to be really calm and settled um, and safe to ride, but you also want them to respond when you want them to do something for you. And you, you don't want them, you know, you don't want to have to be kicking them along all the time. You do actually want them responsive. So we'll go through the best, the best um, ways to feed to get that kind of behaviour. So the, the first tip and the biggest tip, and if you do nothing else um, other than this, it'll get you so far toward having a horse that, um, has got nice, calm, responsive behaviour is don't feed too much and don't feed too little. So a horse is a, a really funny creature in that it will actually express the amount of energy or calories in the diet. So two words are completely interchangeable when, when you're looking at it from a nutrition sense. Um, so if, if you feed too much energy in the diet, your horse will express that energy in his behaviour. So the behaviour will be much more energetic and, and could be um, could become hyperactive and dangerous. If you don't feed enough, the horse will also express that in its behaviour and will feel quite flat and tired. So you've, you've got to get the amount of energy that you're feeding right. So in looking at this, if your horse is, is putting on condition, um, then it's getting more, <clears throat> more energy, sorry, more energy than he actually needs on a daily basis. You may want the horse to put on condition and if you do, that's fine. But if you've got a horse that um, is in good condition and he's putting more condition on, you're getting, you, you, you've got too much energy in that diet too much calorie and you need to reduce it and also too if your horse is more hyperactive than normal you may not yet see the change in condition um, but just think about if your if your horse does suddenly become a little bit um, more full of himself maybe just reducing the feed down even just temporarily and we'll talk about that in a sec too is, is changing the amount you feed on a daily basis to control calorie intake but just monitor both condition and behavior and if you're putting on condition or the horse is more hyperactive than um, normal then feed less on the other end of the spectrum if your horse is losing condition um, or it's feeling dull and tired when you're working it then you may need to feed more calories so the um, the exception to this is the um, typical warm blood dressage horse that is generally in very good condition um, certainly not losing weight and is also dull and tired so that that's probably more um, along the, the tying up lines and it may not be that you need it well it's definitely not that you need to feed more calories because feeding more calories to that horse is just going to make it fatter and, and it won't give it more energy so you do need to be a little 
bit careful with this one. Um, but certainly with the with horses that um, are, you know they're not heavy in condition already, and they're they're working and feeling a little bit dull, then certainly feeding more feed generally <clears throat> tends to pick those horses up. I had a really lovely story from Feed XL with a, an eventer. Um, and had this horse, she was in, the horse was actually in beautiful condition, wasn't losing condition, but when, when they were trying to do um, fitness work and, and hill work to really build the fitness up on this horse, um, she would only do about half of the work that her rider would have loved her to do. And then she was just flat out tired, um, really couldn't do what, what was being asked of her. And so they would stop. And when <clears throat> this owner assessed that horse's diet on feed excel, she found that the energy intake on that horse was um, a bit lower than what it should have been. And so started feeding the horse a little bit more and instantly almost this horse was a different horse and was absolutely powering up these hills. Um, so it's really important to get that, that energy level right, both to um, stop them from being too hyperactive and having too much energy or also um, preventing them from having not enough energy for you. So the second, um, I've alluded to this briefly already, but the second tip is change feed daily according to the work done. Now, normally people's first reaction to this is what? <laughs> change feed daily, but aren't you supposed to feed the same thing every day? And that was what I was taught um, when I was younger with feeding horses is, is never ever change a horse's feed suddenly so what i'm talking about here is not changing what you're feeding so you, you keep what you're feeding very consistent what i'm talking about is changing how much you feed now if we were live and in kentucky doing this at this point i would be asking for a couple of volunteers to come down from the audience and and actually do this demonstration um, with proper feed dippers, bags of feed and buckets so that you could see, um, and I've got a, there's a video of us doing it at Equitana in Auckland in November last year, um, that if you wanted to watch it, it's on our, on our FedExL Facebook page. Um, but essentially we'll, we can achieve the same thing here with this, with this graphic. So um, what a lot of uh, riders do is feed, and I can completely understand why, but is feed exactly the same amount of feed to a horse every day, regardless of the amount of work that it does. Now, most horses are not ridden at the same level every single day. And in fact, there's horses that will have rest days and then they might have light work days and then um, moderate work days. And depending on just what's going on um, for the week, the, the amount of work that that horse does changes. So you can see on the um, this side of the screen, um, with the we've got the day of the week here and um, what the horse is doing for that day so on Monday it's a rest day now this horse on this side is fed exactly the same amount of feed so he gets this schematically this bucket of feed full every single day regardless of what he's doing so what I've what I've actually highlighted is um, the amount of energy that the horse needs is is in the green and then anything that's fed in excess of that energy requirement I'm going to show in pink so you can see this horse on this day is fed a full bucket of feed but actually that that top rung that pink rung there he didn't actually need that amount of energy for that day because he didn't do anything he was just resting on that day whereas the horse on the other side the owner of this horse has <clears throat> adapted the amount of feed that that horse got on that day. So she's only fed according to his energy requirements. So she's only given him that, that first three rungs of the bucket. On Tuesday was a light work day. Um, so again, this horse on this side got his full bucket of feed and the, the little half um, pink rung up here indicates the, the extra energy that was fed but wasn't needed. Um, and on this side, the horse was only fed what he needed. So if you go down Wednesday, it was a moderate work day. So the horse got a full bucket of feed and he actually needed all of that for that day. Thursday, back to a light work day. And there's that pink excess there again. Um, on Friday was a rest day. So again, had that full rung of um, unneeded energy at the top um, of that feed bucket. Uh, and then Saturday and Sunday were at a competition, for example, and was a moderate work day. And so the horse needed that full allocation of feed. Now you might be going, well, what's the big deal with that? You know, what, what's the problem with feeding a horse that, that bit of extra energy? Well, I like to call it party food for the horse. So over the course of that week, that horse um, got an extra three quarters of a bucket of feed um, that it didn't actually need. And what your horse will do with this energy is put it towards extra 
energy um, in its behaviour. So when we when we did it live, because we had the actual buckets of feed, um, you could see you know the horse that, that was getting fed the same thing every day had so much excess feed in its system by the end of the week. And I said to people, um, you know, who wants to hop on? You know, if your friend asked you to go around and ride your horse on the on the Monday, um, who would hop on this horse after it having this much excess feed? And I, I didn't have one taker. Um, I know that I probably wouldn't be that keen to hop on that horse after being fed the same thing. So if you've got a horse, this is not going to affect every horse um, acutely, but if you do have a horse that is really quite sensitive um, and, and really does reflect the amount of energy in his feed, in his behaviour, it's a really good idea to feed um, the way that, that this horse was fed in that you, you take the time to stop and think about well, what work did my horse do today and how much, how much feed does he actually need um, and just adjust it. So I'll show you the next slide's got, um, well, the next slide's got what happens when you feed um, the extra energy, you end up with a situation like that. But this slide um, is showing you some examples of, of a rest day diet, a light work day diet and a medium work day diet. So um, a couple of really important things I want you to pay attention to are uh, that the, the ingredients are the same. So we've got this mixed mainly grass hay, um, a high energy complete feed and linseed oil. Um, so on a medium work day, you're getting um, a, a half cup of linseed oil, 4.4 pounds of a high energy complete feed and 22 pounds of mixed mainly grass hay. Um, now also notice too, the grass hay component doesn't change. So um, they always get plenty of hay. And, and I would suggest if you're going to reduce anything, don't reduce the hay because the hay is so important for gut health, leave it in there. Um, but on the light work day, so we've got 4.4 pounds of the high energy feed on a medium work day. On a light work day, that goes down to 1.1 pounds of a high energy complete feed, and that will be enough to meet that horse's energy requirement. Now, on these light work days, we've also introduced a very small amount of a vitamin and mineral supplement, which is fine to introduce um, on light work days. It's not going to make such a big change to the diet that it will cause any issues with the gut. But that's just in there because in reducing this high energy feed down, you're also reducing the amount of vitamins and minerals down. So that's just in there to keep the diet balanced for you. Um, and then on the rest, Day, we're going right down to just 0.2 pounds of the high energy complete feed. So it's still in there, um, it's still keeping everything familiar for the gut. And, and then you've got this concentrated vitamin mineral supplement. You could, if you wanted to, feed um, a little bit of extra grass hay on those days um, and adjust it around. But it's just a, a bit of an idea of how you might change a diet on a, on a day to day basis throughout a week to just keep a lid on the amount of extra energy that your horse is getting in his diet. So you can use FeedXL to work out those different diets um, and that will show you how much you need to adjust the feed to meet calorie requirement and also whether or not you need to add a vitamin mineral supplement in to keep vitamins and minerals balanced. So the third tip um, for nutrition is feed a balanced diet. So this graph is um, straight out of FeedXL. So in the results of FeedXL, you'll see something like this. So this line down the middle here um, indicates the 100% of daily recommended intake requirement being met. So when something is at that line, it means that you're fully meeting your horse's requirement for that nutrient. And we've got all the nutrients running down this side. Um, it's actually cut off. There's a bunch of vitamins that um, are down here as well. So there's a lot more nutrients than that um, in, a, in a full analysis. But this is just to give you an idea. There's some nutrients that are really important for behavior. So magnesium is one of them. Um, you can see the requirement down here for magnesium as well and truly met. Vitamin B, which sits down here a little bit further is also very important um, for behavior. And also making sure that you, you have this digestible energy. So this is your calorie calorie level um, sitting around it, it's fine not to be at 100% um, and you'll you'll find where your horse is um, comfortable so horses vary a lot in their energy requirements so if you've got a horse that um, is very devoted to grazing and doesn't move very much during the day um, you'll find that it's it's energy requirement um, may be a little bit lower than a horse that that is quite active in the paddock because it, it's burning up a lot more energy just naturally um, in it in its pasture environment so it's just a matter of finding where your horse is comfortable but um, getting the diet balanced is is really important because if your horse is fighting a vitamin or mineral deficiency and you're also fighting with um 
either low energy. So uh, if, you, if your horse, for example, is low in, the, in some of the B vitamins that are really critical for energy generation in the muscles, then you'll see fatigue as well. And we, we do see that in practice. Um, and also too, if, if um, they're low in, in things like magnesium and B1, then you'll, you'll possibly get hyperactive behavior associated with that. So the fourth tip is keep the hindgut bacteria healthy. So th this is a whole um, hour or a couple of hour presentation just in itself. But remember we spoke about the, the dopamine um, being really important. Um, so they, they produce these hormones, but um, to keep your horse calm and relaxed. They also, um, if you unbalance the gut bacteria and, and probably the easiest way to, to unbalance gut bacteria is to feed a lot of grain um, and cracked corn is by far the worst grain um, and will have the most damage in the hind or do the most damage in the hind gut. So if you're feeding a lot of grain and not enough hay, you're, you're going to shift the population of hind gut bacteria from the good fibre fermenting bacteria. So the fibre fermenters are the ones that we really want in there um, toward the starch fermenting bacteria who uh, we don't we don't want the starch fermenters in there. So when they ferment starch, they produce a lot of acid, and they produce um, lactic acid, and, and that abrades the gut wall. You can get um, leaky gut from that because the the gut wall is actually being damaged, and it's not this perfect barrier between the gut contents and the body anymore. Um, and there's a lot of pain that is associated with that condition as well. So um, probably the the outside of not feeding too much. Um, this would be the next most important in line is just making sure that, that the way you are feeding is supporting gut health. We um, so have spent quite a bit of time with um, Dr. Samuel Julian from uh, Lab to Field in France in the last little while doing uh, webinars. And, and he, he said, and I think it's such a classic piece of advice. He said, you know, we've been studying gut health for 60 years and our single biggest tip for improving the hindgut health or the overall gut health of your horse is feed more hay. <laughs> um, so, you know, like they've been doing all this incredibly technological um, research and, and the conclusion they've come up with is, is just get more, get more forage into your horse's gut. So the more you can, the more you can skew your horse's diet toward being hay, pasture, um, any type of any type of forage, so hay cubes and pellets, of course, fit into into that. Um, they they all because that's naturally what a horse is supposed to have in its gut. It all supports um, better gut health, and then better gut health supports better behaviour. So it's a really important one. Um, we've got a heap of stuff written on our website about that as well. If you want to come and, and read up on that, just um, at feedxl.com, and then we've got a, a thing called Knowledge Hub. It's all free information. We'd love for you to come and to come and read it. Um, Tip number five is manage PSSM tying up. So um, I've got a, a list of ingredients here. So with, with PSSM, what you, what you want to do is restrict the amount of starch and sugars in the diet because those starch and sugars get broken down into glucose in the small intestine and then the glucose gets absorbed into the blood and then um, it gets sucked into the muscles for storage. So the more glucose you put into that horse's diet, the more glycogen um, gets stored in the muscles and then the more damage um, will be done from a PSSM perspective. So there's a, there's a list of ingredients to avoid here. At the end of the presentation, I will give you a link to a free ebook um, that has got all of this information or snap a, snap a shot of the screen, but um, pretty much they're all the cereal grains. So things like your oats, corn, wheat, rice, um, and then there's the cereal grain byproduct. So depending on where you are in the world, um, they're called different things. And you guys, you generally call them wheat middlings or mids. So it's the, um, the essentially the, the kind of the waste that's left over after wheat is milled for human flour um, and also rice bran and corn gluten meal fit into that category. Uh, and, and any processed grain as well. So anything that's micronized, extruded, steam flaked or pelleted um, and made from grain is also a definite to avoid. And if you can avoid all of those things, then um, you'll be a long way toward get, uh, reducing the amount of glycogen that gets stored in your horse's muscles and reducing the impact of tying up. Do also be quite conscious of the sugars um, in your forages. So if you've got a, a high non-structural carbohydrate or high sugar, high starch forage, that is enough to trigger tying up. So we do see horses that will tie up on say ryegrass pasture um, or oaten, hay, wheaten or barley um, forage, any cereal forage that can be quite high in starch and sugars, that will be enough to trigger tying up too. So uh, 
Um, this little graphic here just shows you in feed Excel, if you tick that your horse has got the PSSM form of tying up, it will actually color code the ingredient list that's available to you to show you what's safe. So sunflower seeds, for example, are very low in starch and sugars, and so they're safe for the, the tying up horses. Uh, whereas corn gluten meal is, is um, too high and should be avoided. So it just makes it, particularly when it comes to the commercial feeds, um, it'll, it will show you all of the different commercial feeds available to you in the US and um, it will colour code all of them to show you which ones are lower, lower, low enough in starch and sugars to be safe for a PSSM horse. So the sixth one is never ride your horse on an empty stomach. Um, and again, this is a little bit of a brain bender for people because as humans, it's really incredibly uncomfortable for us to do exercise on a full stomach. But you need to be very wary of falling into the trap of thinking that, that what works for us also works for our horse. So a couple of, a couple of huge differences between us and our horse is that um, our, our stomach we're meal feeders so we eat in very distinct meals throughout the day and so our stomach was smart enough um, when it developed to figure out that it didn't need to release gastric acid on a continuous basis um, to help with the digestion of our food so when we as humans start eating food um, our gastric acid production switches on and then when we stop eating food, it switches off. So our stomach can empty and we can, you know, go to sleep and, and sleep for several hours overnight and not wake up with this burning pool of acid in our stomach. Whereas a horse is a grazing animal. So a horse um, eats pretty much continuously. So they'll have a break for maybe one or two hours at a time throughout the day and night. Um, but you would rarely see a horse naturally choose to not eat something for, for um, a period of longer than four hours. Like I don't think I would ever have seen my horses stand around um, for, for more than four hours and not actually choose to go out and eat something. And so because there was always food um, and saliva going down into their stomach to, to buffer their gastric acid. And because there was always a need for gastric acid in their stomach to help with the digestion process, the horse's stomach didn't actually ever develop an on-off switch for gastric acid. And so it is continuously on and continuously secreting acid. Now, if you leave your horse for um, four to six hours without food, the pH of that um, gastric acid can get incredibly low. So down, down to a pH of two to three, sometimes even lower, which is, is really burning um, strong acid. So what happens when you ride your horse on an empty stomach is that the acid has actually accumulated um, in the bottom part of the stomach. And then when you make that horse move, um, the acid actually splashes up into the top part of the stomach. Now, I know um, in my little bio that's on the um, Equitana page, it talks about the, the props that I use. And again, this is much better when, it, when it's um, live and we can actually be together. But um, I love to use these milk bottles to show what happens um, in a horse that has an empty stomach. So imagine that this is the gastric acid that has splashed, uh, sorry, that has accumulated in the bottom of the stomach. And this black line is the line that um, separates the top part of the stomach, which has absolutely zero protection against the acid, um, versus the bottom part of the stomach that is smart enough to secrete really thick mucus um, and protect itself from the acid. So if you've got a horse um, with an empty stomach, there's really cool research that was done in the um, in the UK, I think, that showed that when you start trotting a horse um, and cantering a horse, you just get these this splash of acid. And so effectively what you're doing is you're bathing this whole top part of the stomach in acid. And eventually what happens um, is you'll start to burn holes in the top part of the stomach, which is incredibly painful for the horse. Now, um, the ideal situation is that your horse's stomach is always full. So what we tell people to do is while you're saddling up, um, feed hay to your horse so that it's got, he's got something to chew. Uh, I think for every kilogram of hay, it's estimated that they produce about six litres of saliva and that saliva will actually buffer that stomach acid as well. So it's not as acidic um, when your horse has been eating hay. 
And the other tip is to use alfalfa hay. So alfalfa hay actually um, is a buffer in itself. So it, it creates, again, a more neutral environment in the stomach. And what the hay also physically does, so this is a, another milk bottle, but I don't know if you can see, it's full of, um, it's full of alfalfa that I've, I've stuck in the bottle. And we had the same amount of liquid in the bottle, in the bottom of this container, but you know, I can shake that as hard as I want. Um, and I cannot get any of that fluid above that um, that line there. So we don't ever get any acid splashing up on the top part of the stomach. So of course the effect of that on behavior is your horse isn't in pain when you're working him on a full stomach. Um, and when he's not in pain, then he'll tend to be much happier in his work and, and be a lot better behaved for you. So it's really important um, to keep that horse's stomach full and, and don't fall into the trap of thinking that they're like us. Remember too, they're a prey animal, we're a predator. So we have the luxury of, of chasing animals essentially if we if we want to eat them way back when um and you know i mean we sleep for long periods of time lying down we're not worried about too many things chasing us and trying to eat us whereas a horse is always on full alert and ready to run um at the slightest minute so you know i say to people if if the horse was out grazing on a prairie somewhere way back way back when and some massive predator came along to eat it the horse couldn't very well turn around and go I've just eaten, my stomach's full, I don't feel like running right now, could you just hold off trying to eat me for 10 or 15 minutes um, and let my, let my stomach empty a bit? I mean, they had to run uh, at a moment's notice. So they're designed to run with a full stomach. And in fact, um, making them run and work on, a, on an empty stomach um, causes a whole world of pain and a whole lot of damage in that stomach. So it's really important to have them on uh, working on a full stomach. We've got this little graphic, um, it's also in the ebook that I'll give you the link to, but it just says, if your horse hasn't eaten for the last two or more hours, and I'm sorry, this is only in kilograms, so this is 4.4 pounds of hay if they haven't eaten for the last two hours or more to feed before you ride. If, they, if your horse hasn't eaten for the last half to two hours, give two to four um, pounds before you ride. And if your horse was eating hay or grazing right up to when you caught him, just, just feed a nibble um, when, you, when you're saddling up so that there's still um, chewing and, and saliva taking place. Um, I just skipped over one. Yeah. So um, number seven is feed cool feeds. Um, so we've got a list again. This is in the ebook that you can grab. So a list of, of hot feeds and cool feeds. So if you've gone through everything else um, with your horse and you've ruled out all the other things that, that the change in behaviour could be, it, it could be that what you're feeding is actually um, causing um, the, the behaviour that you're seeing. And, and typically this is if you're seeing um, hyperactive behaviour and you want to feed something that is a little bit um, what we would call cooler. Um, for the horse, so the cooler feeds tend to be your high energy fibres, so things like your sugar beet pulps and your soybean hulls. Um, I've got lupin hulls and lupins on there, which are my favourite ingredients of all time, but you don't have access to them, unfortunately, in the States. They're a very Australian thing. Um, copper meal is in there. Oils are great. Um, high quality hay. So do, don't forget you've also always got the option of feeding a, bill, a better quality hay if you've, if you've got access to it. And, and the more that you can rely on the hay or the pasture in your horse's diet, the better your horse's gut health will be and also the better your horse's behaviour will be. <clears throat> so are mycotoxins involved? Um, we spoke about these before, but they could very well be involved, particularly if the change was, is quite sudden and quite dramatic, um, and especially if your horse is grazing either a ryegrass or a fescue pasture. So these pastures I mentioned really briefly before, they're going to be highest in mycotoxin either when they've got seed heads on them or when they're grazed down really short. <clears throat> so just be mindful of, of mycotoxins because um, it, it could well be what's causing a change in behaviour. So the, the hot horse action plan, um, if you've got a horse that's a bit hot, so first thing, rule out pain or hormones has been the cause of your change in behaviour. Adjust your feed daily. So like we went through with those green and, and pink um, sections on the bucket. So really think about how hard is this horse working today and how much do I actually have to feed him? Um, continue to work on education because their education and also your education as a rider is, um, is incredibly important for getting the best out of a horse in terms of behaviour. Feed lots of forage so you know taking the 60 years of research from France feed feed more hay um, or give more access to pasture 
Make sure the diet is balanced is a really important one. Keep the stomach full. Um, so if you're not doing this already with your horse, just feed feed him hay, alfalfa hay if you can before a ride. But if you don't if you don't feed alfalfa or you don't have access to it, then any hay will do. But just keep that stomach full so that you don't get that acid splashing around. Um, and if, and if you need to or feel like you want to, you can move towards um, the the cooler feeds. Um, your lazy horse action plan. Definitely rule out pain with this one because it, it most of the time, in fact, a majority of the time that we see um, lazy horses, and particularly lazy performance horses, um, it is it is some degree of pain. So either in their hooves or in their um, muscles from tying up. So it's really important to to go right through and, and rule that pain out. Um, work on education. So in my experience, that was my education as a rider, not so much my horse's education. But um, you know, just work with someone who can really teach you how to how to keep a horse moving forward without you having to constantly kick because that constant kicking is actually very counterproductive as i i learned personally um keep keep your horse fit so um, particularly for these these horses that that do feel a little bit lazy like really think about well is he even fit um and get them if you if you ride in an arena a lot get them out of the arena and go and do some hills and roads and trails um and and get them properly fit because it's amazing and it's such a beautiful feeling when you've got a fit horse to ride how much energy they actually do have and how much they will willingly give you um because they they feel like they can and they feel good doing it get the diet balance so like we said there's a lot of vitamins and minerals that are involved in energy generation in the muscle so if your horse is deficient in any of those and you're trying to get more out of them from an energy perspective, you're fighting a losing battle because they simply don't have what they need to make that energy. Um, if all else fails, it's, it's worth switching to a PSSM safe diet. So we, we switch so many horses over to PSSM safe diets um, just because, I mean, one, they're really nice diets anyway. They're very fibre based, very low in starch. Um, and, and so, I mean, they're very safe to try. It's not like you're trying something risky. So it's worth if you, if you are really struggling with um, lazy behaviour, it's really worth switching them over to a, a PSSM safe diet. And also to keep the stomach full. So um, sometimes a horse's reaction to pain in that stomach is just to not want to move very much. Um, and so for these horses, Horses, it's equally important and in fact for all horses and this is this is probably my, my um, single biggest um, focus in horse nutrition is is just getting people to understand that a horse's stomach is not like our stomach and and to ride them on an empty stomach is actually um, it's a pretty cruel thing to do because it would be so painful for them um, so always always keep that stomach full before you ride I know it feels weird um, I know I can't run on a full stomach it feels awful but I also understand that my horses are not like me so um, do you keep that stomach full um, so just really quickly, five ways that FeedXL can help you with all of this is you can plan out your diet. So you can plan your workday diets and your rest day diets um, and allow you to control calories, but also always meet um, vitamin and mineral requirements. So your horse has got everything he needs, but not too much of, of anything to do the work um, that he needs to do. You'll make sure that those nutrient needs for calm behavior are met. And you'll also make sure that the nutrient needs for um, energy generation and the muscles are met. Um, you can find ingredients that you need. So the marketing makes horse nutrition an absolute minefield. So you will find, I know we find a lot of feeds that say grain free, um, and they're actually anything but grain free. So they don't have any whole cereal grains in them but they have a lot of um, byproducts so they might have a lot of wheat middlings for example in them um, and they're not actually um, a low grain so if you're trying to do a, a PSSM safe diet some of them are not actually low enough in starch to be safe so um, FedEx will classifies everything on a on a starch or NSC basis and, and it will color code those feed lists so that you can find truly low non-structural carbohydrate ingredients um, it will make sure that you are feeding enough forage so it won't let you get away with a diet that, that doesn't have enough forage um, in it. And also, too, one of, one of um, the things that our members tell us all the time is that um, they can relax knowing that their horses are being fed what they need to be fed. And it's actually um, pretty amazing 
the impact of a relaxed rider on the horse because horses are so incredibly sensitive to our energy um, and we're probably incredibly sensitive to their energy as well so um, I think anything that can help you relax um, around your horse is also going to change the way they behave so all of this information um, is in this ebook so and it's free we'd love you to go and grab it um, it explains everything that I've just talked about in there and it's got it's got more graphics and, and details as well so it's just on our website Website at feedxl.com slash crazy dash lazy ebook um, or if you go to our website and you can't remember the URL just just search um, ebook or crazy lazy ebook or something and it, it will come up for you so we'd love for you to go and grab that um, to help you out with a horse and its behavior and with that I am done Nicole <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Uh, yes. Okay. So we have a couple questions. Uh, can you see me? Just out of curiosity. Can you see me? I can see you. Can you see me? Oh, yeah, I can see you. Okay, yep. perfect. Sorry. <laughs> a little tech issue on my end. Um, this may be more of an issue in the States, but how often do you find environmental contaminants affecting behavior? Ooh, um, did they say what type of contaminants? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, it's certainly possible. It's not something I haven't dealt with that here and I haven't dealt with it in, this, in the States either. But I mean, there is a bunch of things that will um, cause changes in metabolism. So um, one that I can think of really quickly off the top of my head is nitrate. Um, so excess nitrate in water, for example, um, and what nitrate will do is pull magnesium from the body uh, and then magnesium is required for the activation of vitamin b1 and, and so you get this whole um, kind of cascade around the effect of, of nitrate on um, the horse's metabolism and then potentially on behavior but yes depends what the contaminant is but i'm going to say definitely possible and if they if they want to we've, we've got a um a nutrition forum so the feed excel horse nutrition forum it's it's open to everyone you don't have to be a member of feed excel so if you if you want to if you've got a specific contaminant in mind and you want to ask specifically jump in there and stick your question in there and i can um, answer it for you if it's something that you're dealing with amazing um, and i think you brought up a really good point um, about the grain free trend i feel like marketing has just owned that and kudos to them they've done a great job but it's definitely very important to research the ingredients on the bag i can't um just i don't actually have a horse anymore but just with dog food the same thing it's it's changing so frequently and it's, mm -hmm. it's gotta be careful what's in there um for you touched on the hot feeds and the cool feeds mm -hmm. uh, so back in the day when i had a horse she was an ex race horse and we weren't really educated on the hot feeds and cool feeds they just said calming supplements herbal supplements just keep throwing them in there what yeah. are your feelings on that <laughs> Uh, yes, actually, you know, I just realized as I was going through, I said at the beginning, I was going to talk about calming supplements and then, and then I didn't. So, um, look, I think uh, you guys have got bushfires raging at the moment. We obviously had bushfires raging back here in January. If you've got the underlying diet um, not supporting good behavior, putting calming supplements in on top of that is kind of like using a garden hose to put out a bushfire. Like it, it's not, it's, it, it can't override. So say for example, you've got a horse that's in very light work and you're feeding it at a grain feed um, at the level that you probably should be feeding if the horse is in moderate to heavy work. You know, that horse has got so much energy in its system that there's no way putting a calming supplement in on top of that is gonna calm it down. Um, one of my whole poet, again, I seem to talk about poet a lot, but he's such a good case study for so many reasons. But he, um, he cut his foot and I was going away. It was so wet at our place at the time. And so I, I took him into the local equine veterinary clinic and basically said, can you babysit him for, <laughs> for four days? Um, because, you know, I can't, I can't leave him where he is. And um, I got back after four days. The vet nurses flat refused to go in the box with him. No one could catch him. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'd taken his feed. So I said, just hay 
and this like it was like 100 grams of a vitamin mineral supplement um, in a little bit of chaff they'd been feeding him a full grain based working horse feed for four days <laughs> in a stable and he was breathing fire like he was cr out of his mind um, I took him home I was so worried that he was going to hurt himself I actually tied him up to a safe fence and he read and bucked on the end of that lead rope for half an hour I couldn't believe it. So, I mean, for me, that was just like this, this perfect illustration of party food. Um, yeah, the party food. There was, it was so far over what he needed, you know, and if I was to go and put a calming supplement in on top of that and continue to feed him like that, you wouldn't have seen any, any impact. Um, there is supplements that we use to good effect, um, in situations where horses are like have got behavioral issues, but generally they're, they're focusing on fixing the actual problem causing the, um, the behavior. So, you know, it might be a gut health supplement that is focused on repairing the lining of the gut and taking that pain away because it's the pain that's causing the, the changes in behavior. So, but again, even with those, you've got to have the underlying diet, right? That's the most important bit. Um, otherwise it, your supplements won't work. Now, unless we have any other questions, let's check real quick here. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us. And again, I am very excited for you to come to Equitana just for the props. I loved it. <laughs> I'm such a visual learner. I have more. I didn't know. I didn't talk about my little bit of starch, but, um, but yeah, there's all sorts of, there's building blocks here and there's all sorts of... <laughs> My bag when I travel is usually half full of stuff that looks like kids' toys. So. Okay, airport security must love that. <laughs> I, know, I must wonder what on earth it is. But yes, I would love to join you when when we're um, back and traveling the world again. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to come. It'd be awesome. No. And thanks for having me today, Nicole. Of course. And if um, anyone has any questions, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, so um, honestly, the best way is to, to come and join our um, Feed Excel Horse Nutrition Forum on Facebook. Um, it's a really gorgeous community of horse owners um, so it's very supportive and very friendly and um, I am in there answering questions and we also have um, Samantha Potter who's um, a, a very qualified equine nutritionist and A Renee who's based in California um, in there answering questions as well so you get a lot of support for either um, from the other members in there and also from us as qualified horse nutritionists so you're very welcome to join us. That's fantastic. Thank you again. And we hope to see you next October. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Have a good see one. You. you too. Bye. Bye.